recorded. So the recording has just started. Uh, the recording will be sent out to all participants or all registrants sometime uh, early next week, most likely, with some notes from the webinar as well. And we would like to start with the land acknowledgement. So I understand this is a virtual webinar, so we might not all be on Treaty 6 territory, but Tan and I are broadcasting from Treaty 6 territory, which is the traditional gathering place for many Indigenous people. We honour and respect the history, languages, ceremonies and culture of the First Nations, Métis and Inuit who call this territory home. The First Peoples' connection to the land teaches us about our inherent responsibility to protect and respect Mother Earth. With this acknowledgement, we honor the ancestors and children who have been buried here, missing and murdered Indigenous women and men, in the process of ongoing collective healing for all human beings. We are reminded that we are all treaty people and of the responsibility we have to one another. And with that, I'll pass it off to Tan. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll be talking about how to deal with pesky garden pests, sort of from a holistic perspective. So let me give you a little bit of my personal experience from last summer. Uh, I, like many other people, wanted to increase the productivity of my uh, vegetable garden uh, to give me access to more fresh produce. And in the process, I got myself familiar with a couple uh, pests that um, um, impacted my beet productivity here on the left and um, my broccoli productivity here on the right. And I just want to talk broadly first about what makes a pest a pest. So a pest, from my point of view anyways, or in my opinion, is something that uh, is, is something that is foundationally grounded upon your point of view of, of your garden and how you want your garden to be. And so let me first sort of talk a little bit and introduce a few of the groups that are often considered to be pests. So for example, we have on the top left here, a caterpillar of uh, a butterfly, uh, a cabbage white butterfly. Um, we have uh, so clearly an insect. Uh, we also have insects such as ants, which uh, often uh, interpret uh, make mounds in your lawn and also start um, spreading sort of towards uh, wherever they are uh, located. Uh, there are things like slugs, so mollusks or gastropods, uh, slugs, snails, uh, that sort of thing. Um, we have in Edmonton, jackrabbits, um, as well as uh, uh, has been mentioned to me a few times, um, uh, cats can be uh, considered pests by some, even though uh, I like having them around. So let me just first, so those are often uh, major groups of what are considered pests, the insects um, um, and other invertebrates, as well as things that may damage um, your, your crops or your plants in some way. Um, related to the pests are the pathogens. So these are typically microbial or smaller things that also can damage and and disfigure your plants. And so a very common fungus is uh, here on the top left, downy mildew. Um, and on your top right, you have a, a bacterial infection of a leaf. Um, the bottom left is a, a viral infection of a leaf. And um, here we have on the bottom right, um, root rot in the strawberry plants. And so when we think about pests, um, I think one of the things that's really important to consider so from the big picture is that each of these groups, whether it's pests or pathogens, as I called them for the, for the second slide, um, have members that are both uh, um, pesky, as we see in these particular examples, but also uh, very beneficial to, to the plants and to the ecosystem in our garden. So when we think about things like bacteria and fungi, they have very important roles in, in the soil uh, um, uh, system where they help in things like decomposition and can form associations with plants that can help them acquire nutrients and are in fact very important for the health of plants. Um, even when we think about things like insects, 
for every insect that troubles us because um, they are chewing on the leaves of the plants that we are trying to grow. Uh, we have um, many insects that are extremely important for things like pollination, for things like controlling of pests, um, if they're predaceous insects. And so there's always two sides to the, to the coin when we think about um, this, this matter of pests and um, pathogens. So let me introduce to you um, one conceptual model for thinking about um, um, pests and pathogens in the garden. So this is just sort of a big picture thing. And um, it is presented here in the, in, uh, from the perspective of disease, but uh, it applies just as much to um, um, insect pests as well as other kinds of pests. And so the disease triangle uh, rests upon uh, three legs, if you will. One is sort of the presence and uh, of the pathogen or the, or the pest species. The second is that there has to be a susceptible host, uh, the plant that we're interested in rearing. And the third is that there has to be a permissive environment for uh, the pathogen to spread. And when we have a confluence of these three factors, then we have a disease or perhaps a pest outbreak. And so what I want you to sort of appreciate um, there is, uh, is that, um, um, is sort of thinking about um, uh, addressing each of these three components um, together in order to manage uh, the pesky pests or disease. So I'm going to start by introducing sort of a, a very uh, foundational approach in, in agriculture for dealing with pests, and that's called the integrated pest management approach. And this approach uh, stemmed from, uh, arose from um, sort of as a response to the heavy pesticide use in the 50s and 60s in agriculture. Um, and um, it was an effort to try to minimize um, the use of, of chemical pesticides, as well as um, um, reduce the resistance that, that insects and, and other pests would gain uh, with the, with the uh, broad use of these um, chemicals. Um, also sort of from thinking about um, the non-intended consequence of chemical use, uh, um, uh, managers of pests wanted to, to not um, destroy um, parts of the ecosystem that were not uh, targeted by, by things like chemical spray. And the integrated pest management approach um, rests on sort of four pillars. Uh, those are monitoring uh, the action threshold, and I'll talk about these uh, on, in the following slides, diagnosis and the use of multiple control measures. And so there's, uh, I don't want to overwhelm you with this, this sort of hardcore agricultural approach. And certainly when we think about um, managing our gardens, we certainly do not have to implement um, as extensively um, these, these um, pillars of IPM. But the reason I want to talk about this is that I really think it is a very good approach to um, planning um, and managing pests sort of from a, a, a broad spectrum perspective. So um, when, when I think about managing um, sort of pesky pests in my garden, I'm not particularly targeting one thing, but I want uh, a healthy garden in general. So the first step of, of the IPM program is to monitor. And in a garden, that really just means that we look around um, uh, carefully at our plants. But, but for myself, I find that um, if I have the intent to look for things like a little bit of leaf damage or discoloration or the uh, um, direct evidence of, of an insect, i.e. It's, it's there, um, then my eyes just notice different things. And um, if, if you uh, want, you can implement things like little yellow sticky traps, which are, are just little sticky pieces of paper that, that uh, things like insects stick to to help monitor um, if, you're, if you're very serious. 
but just by taking a look at the plants um, and, and actively and regularly um, observing them, um, we can achieve the main goal of monitoring, which is identifying problems early on. And so uh, this is uh, uh, the basic idea of trying to nip the problem in the bud. And so the faster we can uh, identify potential um, pests and pathogens, if you're interested in, in, in controlling them or minimizing them, then uh, it is most effective to, to, um, to catch them early on. The part that in monitoring that sometimes people um, uh, uh, forget or, or, or are not that interested in doing is uh, looking at what's going on in the soil, looking at the soil surface, um, see if there, if there are kinds of growths and um, uh, insects that uh, are not desired. Um, and the other thing is a lot of times if you're harvest, if you see a plant that is not doing well and there's nothing obvious above ground, then it is probably worth um, looking at the roots. So pull up one or two plants and see maybe what's going on beneath the soil. But regardless, this monitoring stage is key to having to, um, uh, to minimizing um, the controls that, that have to be implemented. The second pillar of IPM is what is called the action threshold. And this is sort of a philosophical thing. And I think that, um, this is, uh, uh, everybody has a different view on how they want their garden to, to look. And for, for many, the aesthetics of the garden are very important. For others, uh, the, the productivity of your crops is important. Um, to others, it's just sort of the general plant health. And so what is important though, um, when you're thinking about um, um, planning for pest management, is to determine ahead of time when um, you intend to take action on control measures. And so once again, when we're thinking about a garden, this is not something that we have to do so seriously. So if I see uh, a leaf that's been hit by a leaf miner, then I will probably just pull that leaf off the plant right away and, um, and dispose of it. Um, it's, not, um, it's nothing that is that serious, but um, it requires that you have a plan and a philosophy towards how you want your garden to, to uh, interact with pests and pathogens potentially. The third pillar, um, which is one of the more challenging aspects of, of um, having an ability to specifically uh, deal with um, particular pests or pathogens is a diagnosis phase. And so the reason I put um, these pictures up is that on the top uh, two uh, pictures on the left-hand side, what we have here are uh, frost-bitten plants. So they're frost-damaged leaves. And on the bottom, we have uh, nitrogen-deficient leaves. And so one of the things that is important when we are thinking about pesky pests is thinking about uh, what is going on with your plant. And certainly if the issue is something abiotic like um, a cold snap or, or soil nutrient deficiency, then how you would deal with the issue of plant health is very different from if this damage were caused by, by bacteria or something. And then at the final pillar is um, sort of the idea of using multiple control measures. And so the, the, the Five different kinds of control measures we'll talk about are cultural controls, mechanical controls, physical barriers, and uh, biological controls, as well as natural chemical controls. So the idea of using multiple control measures is in part to, um, to minimize the emphasis on any particular control measure and uh, enhance the effectiveness of any one of the control measures by using multiple control measures. And ultimately it's, it's providing you with a toolkit to do different things to address um, different problems that may be occurring in your garden simultaneously. So let me start uh, 
by discussing cultural controls um, briefly. So the term uh, is far more ominous than it actually is. Uh, cultural control in this context means just manipulating um, your garden's growing, planting, um, and cultivation patterns to reduce pest damage and pest numbers. And these are a lot of the common sense things that we do to manage um, uh, our gardens anyways. So let me give you some examples of cultural controls. So the first thing that uh, we all do is pick the plants or the crop that we want in our garden. And this can have a large impact um, certainly on the kind of pests that um, are possible. So for example, if you grow uh, plants from the cabbage family, then you have the possibility of uh, the caterpillar that we looked at earlier, the cabbage white, um, that uh, um, attacking and eating at your plants. So if you don't grow any cabbage family plants, then that uh, particular problem would, would not be there. Um, and in a similar way, uh, you can choose to have a diversity of plants. I sort of think of this as a bet hedging strategy. And so if you have a wide diversity of plants, then um, any specialist insects that target a particular part of your garden uh, would not necessarily spread to other parts of the garden. And the tricky part about this is that a lot of the plants that we have in our garden are, are actually closely related, even though they may look very different upon first blush. So things like the broccoli I was showing you is related to uh, kale, to cabbage, to Brussels sprouts, all the, the cruciferous um, um, plants. They're actually all the, uh, the same species of plant. And so anything that attacks uh, my broccoli is also likely to be able to attack my kale. And so when you think about uh, diversity, you, you, you sort of need to incorporate um, the, the, the relatedness of, of the crops um, or the plants that you choose. But regardless, um, when you have greater diversity, there's a greater probability that um, um, uh, at least some of your plants will do well without any, um, without any damage. So related to this idea um, of diversity uh, is the idea of creating diversity over time or crop rotation. So if you have, um, I'm gonna harp on my uh, broccoli damage, but if I have cabbage whites one year, although cabbage whites are, are, are very common, so it's probably uh, just an inescapable fact that they'll be around, but it's possible that I skip growing um, um, cabbage family plants for a year or two and then reintroduce them um, in subsequent years, very much like uh, farmers would do, of course, on a much larger scale. And so having uh, sort of a, an expectation that, that managing um, your choice of plants over multiple years can help the health of your, your garden is one way to to use a cultural control to minimize pest damage. Another approach is what is called um, soil solarization. And this um, is an approach that tries to address um, um, soil pathogens and things like weeds. So the basic idea is uh, by exposing bare soil um, covered in plastic to hot weather and sun, um, there's a little bit of of cooking of the soil, drying of the soil, bringing it up to a temperature such that it might reduce the load of these things um, in, in your soil. And for um, problems such as uh, bacteria, um, where they're not really a lot of effective approaches, um, uh, something like soil solarization might be useful um, in those cases. Uh, the idea of sanitation is, is just a Another in the context of cultural control is just uh, the basic idea of cleaning up um, your garden, and and uh, but in a particular way such that, for example, plants that are are infected um, either by pests or pathogens, it is very important to remove those things from from your garden because um, obviously they become uh, a source of, of future. Uh, 
um, infestations. The timing of planting um, can also be um, adjusted um, if you have a long-term view of your garden and you're aware of, sort of the seasonality of different pests. Um, a lot of people prefer to uh, start growing their plants indoors, um, if you're germinating from seed particularly, where you have uh, opportunity to grow the plants to a larger size where they are stronger um, before introducing them outside. And so uh, by doing so, sort of their most vulnerable, uh, sort of younger stages of plants are, are not as exposed to, to things like insects. And um, that, can, that shift in timing can make a big difference in how well um, the crops do. We'll go on to thinking about watering. So watering is something that most of us do pretty much every day. Um, but watering uh, at the right time of the day is very important as far as thinking about um, sort of the, the humidity and, and microclimate around the plant near the soil surface. Uh, watering uh, overly um, increases the possibility of, of bacterial and fungal buildup like the root rot that we saw in the previous image because um, uh, Fungi and bacteria, like many organisms, thrive when they are given um, moist conditions and they use that water. So um, part of it is if the soil dries out between watering, then it becomes a more challenging environment for at least some microbes. And hence, um, um, spacing out your watering, not overwatering, are things that you can do, and I'm sure most of you do, to um, maintain the health of your soil. Weeding and thinning are related to this. Um, um, sometimes we don't think about um, the importance of things like airflow from the perspective of plants, but, but um, diseases like um, downy mildew, um, they really thrive under uh, moist conditions. And so if there is uh, there's a high density of plant matter, so in other words, just sort of a wall of plants that really cuts down on the flow of air, then um, any uh, water or moisture that's introduced to your garden might have, uh, might not evaporate for relatively, like the surface water might not evaporate for a relatively long period of time, thereby um, facilitating the establishment and growth of, um, of things like down and And so having um, some level of, of weeding and thinning just to, to keep um, um, good flow of air around your garden can be very important. And weeding is an aside. Um, so one of the, the key um, thoughts as to uh, thinking about the, the disease uh, triangle is that overall a plant is less susceptible, um, the more healthy it is. And so um, by reducing the competition a plant might have with neighboring weeds can help enhance uh, the the health of the plants that you want in your garden. And so um, weeding, of course, we do it for aesthetic reasons and um, for, for wanting to enhance the growth of our plants, but it actually has an important role in, in uh, maintaining the plant health that, that will help a plant uh, naturally defend itself against uh, pests and pathogens. And uh, the last thing we'll talk about to, for today uh, about cultural controls is, is soil amendment. And this ties into this idea that uh, of weeding where um, things that can enhance the health of your plants. So soil amendments can be uh, addition of, of nutrients, um, whether sort of chemically through things like fertilizers or um, through composts um, or just sort of the natural, natural addition of organic matter these things can, can help your overall plant health and vigor and thereby promote um, their natural defenses against um, um, their enemies or their, uh, I guess I think of them as the predators of plants, but um, the plant's natural enemies. So plants are incredibly good at protecting themselves um, because they are um, um, the target of of many things that like to eat plants. And so 
um, by keeping a plant healthy, uh, you're giving the plants in your garden the, the best chance to protect themselves. So mechanical control is, um, is a, 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 as the name suggests, the, the physical and uh, mechanical removal of uh, individual pests themselves. So when I see a caterpillar or a slug, um, I, I will just pick it up and move it somewhere else, um, perhaps to the back of my garden um, and um, let it go there. Um, but uh, people um, uh, can also just squish them if you want, um, uh, or whatever um, you, you can do to remove individual pests. But this relates to this idea of monitoring where at very low densities, if you catch pests uh, early on before they start uh, reproducing in your garden, then just the individual removal of one or two uh, insects can have a pretty big impact on the overall um, uh, pest level for the season. The other thing that um, uh, perhaps more related to pathogens, um, but uh, uh, plants can be sort of pruned or um, um, the damaged leaves can be um, removed um, individually um, in order to minimize, once again, um, the number of pests or pathogens um, or, uh, and also prevent their reproduction. Um, so the picture you saw at the very beginning of, of my beet leaves, I, uh, as soon as I saw the leaf mining that was taking place, I started um, removing the leaves that were damaged directly. And um, in the end, I was able to, um, to salvage some beets, but, um, but uh, it was a, a pretty uh, tough battle because um, um, overall they, uh, I was not able to, um, to get rid of, uh, of all the, the leaf miners. And so in, in general, if I was really sort of intent on pest control, one of the things that we do typically do in a garden is just uh, uh, remove the plant that is damaged um, so that it, it um, does not spread to nearby plants. And um, um, part of the idea of having diversity is that the loss of any one part of your garden uh, hopefully would, would not impact the overall um, garden too much. Another thing that's uh, very useful um, and uh, very um, uh, sustainable, if you will, are physical barriers. And so uh, I've been asked a few questions about um, handling things like uh, rabbits eating your crops and, and cats in your gardens. And um, it is hard to uh, uh, beat some sort of physical barrier as far as um, um, managing things like that. Um, so what we have here on the left-hand side is a raised bed. And surprisingly, um, the rabbits that we have around town are not uh, particularly good at jumping. And so uh, anything over, let's say, two feet uh, is probably high enough um, for, for preventing uh, rabbits getting in there uh, or fencing higher than sort of two or three feet at most. Um, cats are, are um, um, more of an uh, uh, obstacle in the sense that they can jump sort of a little better than the rabbits we have around here. But fencing certainly can, can prevent um, um, cats from attacking any particular part of your garden. Um, they don't necessarily, of course, eat the plants, but, uh, but they may um, scrounge around and, and, um, and uh, damage your garden that way. Um, the other thing that uh, I do sort of conscientiously in terms of the planning, and this is sort of a, a, a cultural control, is that um, um, for food crops that I want uh, not eaten by rabbits, I plant them in a fenced backyard part of my garden. And so rabbits uh, naturally do not like um, sort of being in enclosed spaces because their their number one defense is running away. And so they uh, they prefer um, areas that have uh, multiple open lanes of escape. And so typically, and this is not definitive, but typically they tend to avoid areas that are are enclosed um, just visually. Um, and so um, by just growing things like uh, lettuce 
in my backyard, um, I, I seem to avoid uh, most rabbit damage. Things like row covers are also very handy to, to plan and uh, have in your garden because they can be used um, for covering plants if you have a particularly high density of, of attacking insects. Um, they can just be physically covered for a few days while the density subsides. But they're also handy because once you have them and, and plan for them, then you can have, um, uh, you can use them to protect your plants against things like frost. And so um, uh, just sort of, I guess in a long-term way of thinking, uh, these, these physical barriers can also have uh, multiple purposes. An important um, aspect of, of controlling pests from, uh, in a garden is also biological control. So as we previously um, talked about, um, when we think about things like insects, there are those that are pesky and that they eat our, our, um, our plants, but there are also those that are very beneficial uh, in that they eat the pesky insects. And so one of the arguments for keeping uh, a diverse set of plants and, um, and a diverse ecosystem and not using sort of general uh, pesticides is that we can maintain a healthier natural environment to encourage natural predators of our, our pests. And so uh, I personally do like things like spiders. So I know, I know a lot of people do not. So I do not uh, move them if I see them because I sort of think of them as uh, helping my uh, pest control cause. Um, things like ladybirds are incredibly, uh, ladybird beetles are incredibly voracious predators. Um, I don't really encourage buying a whole bunch of ladybird beetles like as you can um, from various um, gardening centers because a lot of times if you're outdoors, they'll just, they'll just fly away and there's no guarantee that they'll eat um, um, uh, the pests that are in your garden as opposed to somewhere else. And a lot of them are not uh, native species of, of beetles. Um, but you can do things that encourage uh, ladybird beetles to, to visit your, your garden. Um, and this includes simple things like um, keeping flowers in your garden, such as sunflowers uh, um, that have pollen that, um, that beetles in their adult stage like to, to consume sometimes. This is uh, the same ladybird beetle in its larval stage here in the inset picture. And they are uh, voracious predators of things like aphids and leaf hoppers and so forth. And uh, any one of these uh, uh, insects can eat tens, uh, often hundreds, and sometimes even thousands of individual aphids in a single day. And so um, they may be uh, small looking, but they can be very effective in, um, in managing um, pest populations. Uh, I would like to at least um, introduce the idea of, of uh, this, this uh, bacterial insecticide. So uh, Bt um, is a bacteria that naturally grows in the soil and it's used in large scale control of, of outbreaks of things like, um, uh, uh, like forest pests. And um, it is available for, um, for home use. Um, it, it works by essentially killing uh, insects through damaging their gut, uh, particularly effective on things like uh, butterfly caterpillars. But once again, although this is a natural uh, uh, biological control, um, it, uh, personally, like I find that um, I'm not interested in um, sort of the, the um, collateral damage that something like this can do to, to the many butterfly larvae and butterflies that I do want to keep in my garden, and so, um, but but I just want you, uh, I just want to let you know that that is something that people do that's considered a biological control. So another very popular uh, um, um, spray um, product that is used today is uh, neem oil. So neem oil. Um, the high quality stuff is produced from extracts uh, from the neem seeds, uh, a plant that grows uh, natively in 
uh, India. And um, it is a very uh, effective um, spray product for, for things that are typically found on the surface of a plant, such as, once again, things like aphids, white flies, um, and maybe even mites. Um, it uh, comes as an oil and uh, you, can, you can get it sort of as a product that's mixed with water. You usually want to use some sort of emulsifier, like, like a little drop of soap to keep the oil and the water um, uh, emulsified or sort of homogenized, if you will, so that um, there isn't a high and low concentration of neem oil in your spray bottle. Um, it's not, uh, it, is, it is an oil, so it's not great to use on the leaves of things that we like to eat because it doesn't wash off easily like lettuces but it, is, uh, it has been tested and, and um, essentially deemed non-toxic to, to mammalian organisms. Uh, it, was, it was tested on mice. And, um, and so it, it's widely used um, as a spray. And what's important is that uh, whatever spray you, you make, it has to be relatively fresh and, um, and it has to directly contact, um, sort of cover uh, the the pests that you are trying to, to remove. And um, if you spray it, and, and they will sort of leave a gloss on your plant. And um, the active ingredient, uh, which has been synthesized sort of um, chemically for um, sort of more potent extracts. But, but what's nice about the natural neem oil is that it's thought to have um, other compounds that are also fungicidal as well as um, detrimental to pests. And so um, this is one thing that a lot of people use um, uh, e even indoors because of its non-toxicity. Non Another basic spray that has been used for, for um, centuries is just soap water, uh, low density soap concentrations. You can uh, buy something, um, a product um, from, from the gardening store, or you can make something very simple with um, a pure soap that is generally uh, unscented and so forth. Uh, about one to two percent concentration in a spray. Um, some people add vinegar or baking soda, depending on whether um, they're interested in, in trying to uh, reduce things like um, leaf surface fungi. Um, once you mix it up, you want to use it fresh. And just like um, when you are um, you know, spraying, uh, your, your leather products with, with some sort of spray, you want to spot test it. You want to, you, with any of these products, including the neem, sorry, is you, you do want to first try it on a small part of your plant and um, see if uh, it is toxic to that plant. Um, the neem uh, is generally uh, uh, tolerated by um, all the plants I've tried, but it's always better to be safe than sorry. You just have to spray it one or two days before you do a big spray and you'll have a good idea of whether it's safe for your plant. Um, this, uh, and, and the same with the soap. So the last uh, natural product I'll talk about, um, and it's particularly useful, I guess, for dealing with things like ants, is the diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth is sort of the, is the fossilized uh, um, shells of, of these diatoms. So on the left hand side, we have a, a wide variety of diatoms um, that, um, that are largely can have these shells that are composed of, of silica. And um, what's sort of interesting, um, maybe hard to believe, sometimes I have a hard time believing, is these algae are probably responsible for 20 to 60 percent of the oxygen that we breathe. Uh, so they're in incredible high uh, uh, densities, uh, hard numbers in the oceans. Um, so when they fossilize and they're powdered, and if you look at it uh, with a microscope carefully, you can see that they are uh, very jagged. And um, the impact of, of diatomaceous earth, um, uh, like if you sprinkle it on an ant nest, um, perhaps laced with a little sugar so they take them in, is that it has the effect of, of essentially um, killing ants by attacking, uh, by cutting them with these jagged edges, whether internally or externally. 
And so um, this is a natural product. Um, I personally would recommend wearing just some sort of mask so you don't inhale it. I know that it's sort of a popular dietary supplement at the moment, but um, so just based on this image on the bottom right here, I personally would not want to breathe it in. So um, it is not, it's not toxic by any means, but um, it is um, very useful to use and it can be sprinkled around um, uh, the plants, uh, not just for ants um, on an ant nest, but around plants if, if there are things like slugs um, and other insects that you want to get, off, get, get rid of because uh, it has sort of this broad general uh, impact. So the last thing uh, I'd like to talk about is just um, as part of your control, and we talked about cleaning as a cultural control, um, is the proper disinfecting and disposal of um, all the tools as well as the material that's generated in your pruning or removal. So it, nothing fancy, it just, uh, it's, you just wanna put it in a, uh, put whatever you collect whatever you rake up in a sealed bag uh, and tie it tight so that uh, things can't escape. And uh, that's all you have to do. Um, when you have tools like pruning tools, um, uh, professional uh, horticulturists will use something like a propeller here, which uh, is just spray to disinfect your tools. But you can just do that with soap and water or, or um, a mild, uh, an alcohol spray that we all have handy these days. And, um, and you do need to disinfect your tools because otherwise each time you are cutting um, a plant and uh, even if you cut a different part of the plant, you may spread it to a different, uh, your pathogen to a different part of the plant. And certainly if you uh, start cutting a different plant, then there's that possibility of spreading the pathogen, um, you being the vector. And so um, this is not, um, I never like cleaning my tools because it seems, uh, it just doesn't seem fun, but it is a very important part of, of pest management if you are really trying to deal with pests and pathogens. All right, so I am happy to try to answer your questions uh, as best as I can. And thank you so much for, for um, spending time with us this afternoon. Um, if you're interested in potential future workshops, just please feel free to sign up to our newsletter. Thank you for spending time with us today. Awesome. Thank you, Tam. Uh, we do have some questions in the Q&A here. Uh, okay. The first one, I think, was when you were talking about root rot and yeah. sort of overwatering. And someone asked, is there a good time of day to be watering your plants? Um, so I typically, sort of for water conservation reasons, like to water um, either early in the morning or um, uh, sort of early in the evening when it is um, not as hot and that gives, um, uh, there's just less evaporation of the, the water that you um, are, are putting on your plants. I think it's important that, um, particularly if you're worried about things like um, root, or, sorry, like downy mildew, you want, to, um, you want to get the soil as much as you can I'm not particularly good at this, but um, the soil, it, it's good to wash your leaves once in a while for sure, but, um, but if you're sort of watering pretty regularly, it's good to, to be thinking about targeting at least the soil. Um, as far as root rot, uh, root rot is, isn't so much an, a matter of timing so much as a matter of quantity of watering. And so I like to see there being some level of drying between waterings. Um, and, and that's usually no problem when, when the weather is like it is right now, um, hot and pretty dry, um, but, but uh, particularly maybe even coming uh, out after a rainy period or something, then you might be more careful about the amount that you water because there's already a lot of water in the soil. And um, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you. A uh, couple of questions on neem oil. It seems okay. quite popular. Uh, yeah. Would you apply neem oil when you see signs of pests or pathogens, or do you use it sort of as a precaution? Uh, um, it is. Time? It is best used right on the pests, and so um, it is like the soap water. 
most effective um, when it is applied directly on the pest. Um, it's not like some of the chemical um, pesticides that have um, sort of cont contact uh, impact even after you spray. So um, this is something you want directly on the pests. Um, I, I think that it's, uh, it's yeah, it, I would use it judiciously regardless because um, uh, it's actually like very tiring to just like spray <laughs> any large quantity of plants. So uh, I, I would typically use it for, for targeting pests and particularly if you can find them early on, um, it's, it's, it's quite effective. And I think that might sort of answer the next question. Um, so neem oil, is it better to be used on leaves or sprayed onto the dirt or both? Or is it just wherever you see the pests? Um, it is where you see the pests for the most part. So it's not, um, uh, it's not something you, you can spray and leave down and, and hope for effectiveness. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is specifically about beets and raising beets. So this individual, uh, they think they might have uh, beet miters or some kind of pathogen. The beets are in raised beds and they've been trying for about two years now, but they can't grow them. Is there a common beet pest or do you know any defenses for beets, something that'll help them grow? So I'm very sympathetic to your beet problems. They uh, definitely death damaged uh, um, the, the miners um, damaged my, my uh, plants last year and reduced the size of the beets that I had because I, kept, ha uh, I had to keep removing um, the beets. Um, I think this is, for, for me, um, when I think about how to deal with, with this issue, what I'm, I'm trying this year is growing the beets in a different part of the garden. Um, I, for, like, so this idea of diversity for me, because I'm not a beet farmer, uh, is that I'll try and um, I, I think the best approach is probably just to, if they're really heavily damaged, I would just remove them um, uh, entirely this year. Um, the idea of crop rotation can help where if there are um, insect uh, eggs that are sort of uh, in the soil, then typically, and they're specific to the, the beets, then um, not growing beets and not giving them a host for one or two years might um, help um, um, the situation. Uh, I, I also uh, am trying just using um, a new batch of soil. That, that, that's, so that's the, the effort to draw, uh, try to grow them in a different part of the garden where I'm just using a potting mix from a completely uh, a different source and growing the beets there um, and hoping for the best. Um, but once again, there's, it, it sort of depends upon uh, the particular circumstances um, and the particular pest. And so what I always suggest is um, taking pictures of, of the beet uh, damage, the damage that happens on the leaves. And if you have a keen interest, you can just sort of get a, uh, a sharp knife and try to dig out the pests and, and try to um, see what they are um, because many different things will uh, cause uh, similar looking damage, if you will. And so if you're really, if you're really like, so, so this is one aspect I did not talk about sort of pest management is there's the biological side that is sort of very interesting. And um, if you're sort of interested in that kind of problem solving and learning, then, um, I think of that as a, a different kind of, of, of joy, I guess, in the garden. Perfect, thank you. Um, speaking of pictures, yeah. is there a good app that you know of that could help identify different insects you see in your garden? Hmm. That I'm not um, familiar with. I know that there are a lot of apps for identifying plants, but that's something if I find out more information about I would uh, I would like to follow up on um, like maybe p potentially post uh, so uh, we're starting a FAC um, a page um, so that these questions that are uh, are asked by the wonderful audience um, we can record and sort of try to uh, 
know, make a little web page so that you can refer to that. And if I if I find anything about that, I will I'll post that. Um, the diversity of of just to be clear, like the diversity of of pests and pathogens isn't overwhelming. Um, I think that if you have a good image, a good visualization of whatever your um, whatever is attacking your plants, I think you have a pretty decent chance of finding people on Facebook or or whoever uh, wherever um, to help identify the problem. Um, I guess I always think about the the sort of the end of this this train of thought, which is uh, what am I willing to do about it anyways? And because for a lot of things, I'm not really going to spray them. Um, I may try like neem uh, sort of just as a general approach, but um, otherwise I'll just remove the plant because um, I'm not gonna, I'm just not gonna spray them with things like uh, chemicals. So I guess uh, it, it sort of depends on uh, what your perspective is, whether you want to solve you want to know more about what is going on or whether you just want uh, to, uh, to get rid of, of the heat attackers. Thank you. Uh, another question about slugs, uh, which okay. is interesting pest. This year we've used copper tape around the beds and we're hoping that it'll work, but we've heard that coffee grounds can also help. Uh, we've had slugs attack our hostas. What else do you think would work? So uh, I have uh, heard copper tape as well as copper mesh works, um, particularly around the base. Um, if the wonderful thing about things like YouTube is that uh, you can see many uh, videos about copper tape fails uh, and slugs are just walking across them. The, the um, idea with copper is that uh, there's ions that, that create a sensation, if I'm understanding it correctly, in things like slugs and snails that feels a little like uh, electrocution and hence they avoid it but but clearly this is not universally the case um, with slugs um, I, i've read sort of different approaches sort of like physical things like a, a barrier like sort of almost like a little wall of of copper mesh around the base of the plants so the slugs can't slugs can't fly um, so, or unless they can drop in from above, something that sort of prevents them from climbing can help. Um, I also find that slugs um, really do prefer pretty uh, moist um, environments if, uh, if, if it's available to them. And so this is sort of one of the cultural controls where um, I, I sometimes think of sort of having too humid sort of uh, ground level around your plants uh, might encourage things like slugs to to persist and do well. Um, I, uh, so the, the thing that I am naive to is that I've never had like a huge infestation of slugs. So for me, um, it's not that onerous for me to just like pick them up and literally move them to another part of the, the garden. Um, the slugs can just, they can just eat the plants. So they, they, they can chew, chew them up and do Quite a lot of damage because slugs are, um, depending on where you are, are are relatively large compared to a lot of um, insects. Perfect, thank you. Um, so there's two more questions here. I think sure. we'll take those and then we will have to wrap up for today. Um, okay. Do you have suggestions to deal with pocket gophers? They eat my beets. Everyone seems to be the poor beets. <laughs> they beat be, uh, eat my beets and chomp my potatoes. So <laughs> I think pocket gophers are uh, the bane of, of um, many um, farmers and, um, and ranchers because of the holes that they make. Um, I, I mean, this is, uh, so uh, in one of Lois Hole's um, earlier books, um, she wrote something that I, I subscribe to, which is like, I like growing uh, two plants, one for myself and one for uh, the insects, or in this case, gophers. Um, but if uh, I think physical barriers are probably the most effective way of dealing with pocket gophers, if, if it's possible. But the problem is, um, uh, first of all, if you have an area that can be fenced off, and fences are kind of ugly, so it's, it's, that's a different kind of problem depending on how you do it. 
Um, but the other thing with things that like gophers is that you want the fencing to go into the ground, not just at the ground level. And so um, that makes it a pretty uh, big investment uh, of effort. Um, if, uh, uh, yeah, so I, I guess that's sort of um, perhaps something like a raised bed um, or even container um, gardening, depending on, uh, I don't have a sense of like how extensive your garden is. So I know some people have huge potato potato crops and beet crops, but um, if it's not uh, not measured in the uh, many square meters of, of crop, then um, containers can be very useful for protecting uh, um, root vegetables because uh, they're obviously um, sort of separated from, from the ground in some way. Um, and containers don't have to be uh, fancy things. You can just, um, you know, in the neighborhood I'm in, like a lot of people use uh, their old garbage cans as great containers for things like potatoes. Um, um, so I guess that's that's what I might do if I was still determined to grow beets and potatoes in, in the presence of, of gophers. Thank you. And the last question is our, about our lovely friend cats. Is there any way to discourage or prevent cats from pooping in your garden? It's not particularly nice, especially if you're growing food. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I like cats, but um, if they were pooping in my uh, plants, uh, maybe I wouldn't want them around. And so I think once again, um, there's sort of, there's, uh, so two sides to this problem, like that, and that certainly I, I, I'm, you know, like you don't want to do anything to the cat, you just want to discourage them. So I have um, heard that sort of creating um, a rough surface around your plants using things like eggshells um, might deter. Um, okay, so we have another suggestion, lemon peels and citrus works really well uh, around your garden. Um, but um, the other is really fencing. Um, if, if uh, like, and it doesn't have to be in the ca case of cats, I don't think it has to be um, um, uh, permanent fencing because once they're sort of out of the habit of pooping in a particular place, they may uh, move on from that behavior. Um, so it might be uh, as simple as establishing a temporary fencing around your food plants and then um, and sort of tracking the cat uh, activities thereafter. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's probably like in my opinion, the most uh, useful way. I think that this is, I don't like to cause trouble with the neighbors, but um, if you, you know uh, whose cat it is, um, I guess one of the major issues that we're finding um, globally is that cats are, um, are actually one of the, the leading causes of, of, of bird mortality particularly in urban areas. And this is on the order of tens, um, many tens of millions of birds are, are, are lost to cats. And so, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't like to conflict with my neighbors, but, but it's, it's probably not a fantastic idea for, for cats to be roaming as much as um, they have been in the past because of the, the impact on bird populations. But, um, yeah, I, I would I would probably go with the fencing if, if I had if I was very determined to do it. I know like I have a friend whose dad is an engineer and he set up a uh, sensing system of just a motion detector connected to a, a water sprinkler, um, but that's uh, that, that's more passionate than I'm willing to be about the issue. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Awesome. Thank you. That's quite the contraption. Uh, thank you, Tan, and thank you, everyone, for your great questions, and thanks for joining us today. Um, that was a really interesting session. So, as I mentioned at the start, it will be, uh, it has been recorded, so we'll send you a link to the recording sometime early next week. Um, and we are uh, working on a frequently asked questions page, so keep an eye out for that. We will send that to the registrants as well, and it's sort of going to be a space where you can collaborate and help each other out, because that suggestion about putting citrus fruit around the garden, um, it sounds like it, it worked for someone to deter cats, so that, you know, what works for you might work for your neighbors. So that's great. Thanks again, Tan. Thank and you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thanks for spending time with us this afternoon.